yeah, to, to give some um, uh, background, the BEPS project consisted of three pillars, one on coherence, one substance, and the last one on transparency. And as you will see later in the presentation, all these three uh, pillars come together, where now we focus on the TP aspects of intangibles. But you will see that the TP documentation and the elements in the pillar transparency will also give a lot of insight to other stakeholders. I think of tax authorities where it comes to uh, uh, yeah, establishing and, and checking where is your substance. And we can mention, I think already here, the C by C uh, report, which one of the elements is the number of FTEs which are active in a certain country and for a certain entity. And in that respect, it is a first step in uh, full transparency, transparency of the transfer pricing operational model, how many people, uh, number of assets, the organization related to risk allocation, allocation of uh, people functions, allocation of assets in relation to which margin do you leave um, uh, at the end of the year. And therefore, the, the country by country reporting is specially designed for this purpose. And it is a report giving the, the specific data, but also it is a treaty on um, um, uh, full exchange of these data points with the respective uh, uh, tax jurisdictions, and therefore it is a very important um, um, and, 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 and a very um, it gives a lot of insight in where are my outliers and where should I focus on because this will trigger uh, questions from this specific jurisdiction. And one of the uh, columns of table two is of course the, uh, in this sense relating to intangibles, the research and development, and where you will uh, either check is it your uh, main business activity or not. Uh, directly, uh, can it be linked to the number of employees? Another important one is of course the a more routine one where you will see admin, management, or support services. And here, the important one relating to uh, intangibles again, uh, marketing. And if you, if you look at these kind of functions, you divide the value chain of your company already in core functions, highly value adding functions, and support functions, the more routine activities. So the first step to a value chain analysis uh, has already been made because this report gives actually a kind of insight, a kind of overview of where is the value contributed and where um, do I leave most of my margin and is there a, an alignment between the two. Yeah, and the, the link, uh, I think this is the classic example of course of the uh, non-FTE or, or shelf companies or letterbox companies <coughs> resident in, well this uh, arrow is pointing to Bermuda, okay, where you have uh, lots of offices which really exist only of letterboxes, and where you can see in the, the drawing pictured above uh, actual activity on the tax haven country, that's perhaps only 2%. Uh, in the current uh, setup, kind of uh, pre-BEPS, it would be 98% uh, of, of profits uh, being uh, pointed towards the, the tax haven. And uh, this is then uh, something for the far future, unitary taxation uh, based on well assets, uh, salary, uh, payroll amounts, 
and, and FTEs, etc., then immediately you would see the only in this example the two percent for the tax haven because there are no uh, FTEs, there are no assets. And also, the it, it's part of the perhaps more outbound investments, but the European Union are also considering a so-called substance test to determine whether a country or a certain jurisdiction with a zero or extremely low corporate tax rate would qualify as a tax haven if it doesn't reflect real economic activity. And real economic activity would mean FTEs that perform certain control over certain risks. And this would immediately uh, pop up in your uh, C by C. So, going to the next slide. Yep. That is a link to the next slide where we, um, we, we mention the significant people functions related to uh, assets and uh, substance uh, evidence, which are audit trails. If you have to substantiate your substance in a certain ju jurisdiction, make sure that there is um, not only the, 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 the people functions, but also the evidence that these people are really doing something. So they take the key decisions, they control something, they have the last, the last uh, decision in a process so that they have all tools, all manuals, all processes in place to make sure that they, they are really able to do something. And um, so if you, if you look at significant people functions, um, look, is it um, 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 about how many people? Is it about what kind of people? If, if, if I make the distinction between R&D and manufacturing, then uh, a small group of R&D people can be remunerated with more than, for example, a large group of uh, manufacturing people because the character of these uh, functions is, is, is different and their value contribution is different. So from that perspective, a quality versus quantity analysis doesn't say everything. There is a storyline behind it, why uh, it happens as it happens. So remuneration is not one-to-one -one linked to the quantity of people, but should be linked to what kind of people are located in that certain jurisdiction. Yeah, do they have the right experience, the right education to uh, whatever uh, intangible it is in this case? Are they able to control the, um, the risk related to this intangible? And if you take an example of uh, research and development, uh, whether it's uh, blue sky uh, research and development, who is the one that is making the, the ultimate decision to well, uh, continue or to cancel a certain uh, project. And if you don't have any budget responsibility and just performing on command, of course you're uh, controlling less of, of risk in that sense. So that is, that is also said, you show the evidence what is happening where, what, what kind of decisions, what are the processes, do I have audit trails, do I have email trails, um, can, I, can, I, can I give insight in the agendas, uh, where are the decisions taken, uh, to whom do I speak, the, the legal contracts is one, but also the execution of these contracts is really important. And, and last but not least, um, did I not overlook my, uh, uh, my LinkedIn profile? Maybe I'm um, making decisions, maybe I'm very important, but little problem, I'm not located in the location that I should be located, and may I claim that I'm located in a certain jurisdiction where I want to be located, 
but all my evidence shows that I'm still um, located in the Netherlands because of social media, because of uh, the, the, the Twitter account or your Google account or your LinkedIn profile, then I, I'm, I still may have a problem. Yeah, and no, for sure that will also reveal, I think, a lot of your uh, experience and your skills to, to manage this uh, risk or not. I think in the, the it's a kind of classic example where there were a lot of, uh, well, letterbox slash finance companies in the Netherlands, and for, for a while, yeah, I think people were hired just to sit behind the telephone the whole day, smoke a cigar, just in case the telephone uh, went from well, any uh, tax jurisdiction, any tax authorities that might try to find out is there really substance. But uh, nowadays you would perhaps check already the LinkedIn profile and you would see, well, that's not per se somebody with a financial background, but just uh, somebody that is uh, at least able to pick up the phone. So. Um, We've seen, seen tax audits where, uh, of course, and people are asked, oh, please send me over your uh, smartphone, and a backup is made, and a uh, kind of uh, um, IT audit is being performed on where have you been, what was the location, what is exactly the agenda, and, and it's being uh, checked to uh, where are you reporting to also as a person. And that's now, of course, one of the uh, obligatory elements in your local transurprising documentation file. What are the reporting lines of the relevant people, uh, the, the senior management in most cases? Mm -hmm. is it so actually, this is an implementation of what you agreed upon. It's a contractual agreement, but it also should be performed. So economic activities, economic reality, uh, you can call it substance over form, but it is important that the, the agreement is really lived to. Yeah. So that, that brings us to the to the next uh, next slide. The um, the principle is that people functions drive the allocations of assets and risks. So you may create a legal reality. By contract, you can, can agree everything what you want on paper, but the paper is not changing anything unless you really put the people there where they should be. And with those uh, decision makers, with the risks that they control, with their uh, capacity to take decisions and to be able to um, control the risks and to be able to see where the finance should go if these risks really mature, then you have implemented the real structure. If this is not the case, then it's only paper and assets and risk will not follow paper, they follow people. Yeah, that, that's I think where the, uh, all the, the BEPS actions regarding to uh, financial transactions also focus on uh, the, the combating of, of yeah, uh, profit allocation to so-called cash boxes. Uh, in the picture here you can see the funding, but that's not providing the substance. Uh, it's the, the people, most likely somewhere in the treasury hub that would be performing all the back office and perhaps even front office work related to the funding. So although initially perhaps all the interest might end up in this uh, cash box, uh, you would still need to reward the people behind it. So there you can have uh, tension on, on the paper allocation of risk to the cash box company and the yeah, substance of the, the people actually performing the uh, risk controlling activities. So if you have funding but you don't control the risks and you are funding for example the development of an, of an intangible and given the fact 
that there should be a risk return or a risk-based return on, 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 the, on the money invested, then with, it, with no risk control, a risk-free uh, rate of return is possible. Yeah, or is possible only then. Yeah. yeah. And the question is then, uh, this is uh, derived from the current draft on the attribution of profits to permanent establishments. Can those principles, uh, the, the, as we call it, allocation ranking principle, uh, where you almost start with the, the people and then the second phase you, you allocate assets and uh, allocate perhaps risks and then profits, uh, is that also usable for uh, non-PE head office situations? And that brings me to the to the cost contribution arrangement because there you see a similar um, analysis for um, let's say the the, the 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 allocation of the return of this cost contribution arrangement because also there similar to delineating the intercompany transaction there also you need to make uh, a function risk and, and uh, assets analysis. So it is a similar, similar, similar analysis that you need to make for for that purpose. Uh, apart from the benefit test and the and the risk control, uh, there should be a similar analysis on on uh, cost contribution arrangement CCAs. Yeah, let's move to slide number six. Yeah. In slide number six, uh, there is uh, again um, um, the the substance in the middle as the center of where it should uh, be heading to. The conduct of a forum, and that's the, the 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 legal versus the economic reality, and the actual contribution to value creation. So, uh, especially the first part. The economic reality is is the, the 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 one that is important and not not paper or anything else. Um, it is the the real implementation of the agreement that you um, that you signed with that is leading the allocation of uh, of uh, of margins. And then uh, link link to uh, what what is in the right uh, block and the then pay functions mm -hmm. and that, that is then of course the value creation the, the value creation you might say it's dempy but also the the not only the value creation by dempy but also risk um, risk as a result of the dempy functions who is go controlling these uh, these kind of risks and is there a risk assumption or is it just risk mitigation? Because risk mitigation can be outsourced and can be outsourced for uh, a routine remuneration. But is there risk control? Is there somebody who has the capability to, 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 to take uh, the decision on do we accept this risk or do we not go into this? So more like a capital investment decision, then it is a full. Um, there's a full uh, profit, plot uh, profit possible. There is no routine, but really uh, an, an allocation of the profit towards these kind of uh, functions and um, uh, capabilities. Yeah, you can uh, almost make, I think, a nice uh, matrix of the relevant uh, DEMPE functions for your relevant uh, intangible and then combine it with uh, a new paragraph 1.60 with the so-called six steps of risk control and that, that provides some um, process for analyzing the risk in a certain transaction. And where they have uh, six important steps identifying economically significant risks with yeah, uh, relation to your intangible. 
until the level where, where you will see uh, who's doing the more high level strategic setting of risk control until the day-to-day -day mitigation of risks. And also there, of course, like we mentioned in the earlier slide, uh, most likely you will have an audit trail by emails, by uh, any communication uh, method you use, like, uh, hey, Carl, do you agree to this? And only after his uh, approval, some some part of the project relating to this intangible will continue and not, not before. So that's in this small details that you will see the uh, yeah, substantiation and the, the evidence of where exactly the, the ultimate control is and how is it uh, divided. Divided and is the, is the capability in place and do they really have the decision making on the risk assumption. So, is there um, an entry to funding? So, this is these are the, the more important elements on on, on uh, allocation of substance and therefore allocation of uh, of profit. Brings us to the to the next slide on um, how to anchor the DMP functions and risks. So therefore, the um, residual to um, a specific location. We see first, let's say the biggest group, the involvement in uh, in DMP functions. So that is the first filter. Then the next filter would be involvement in uh, especially intangible risk management. And there, there, of course, you refer, I guess, again to this uh, six steps. Uh, to, so that that's also the way you can document it, of course. And then you actually you 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 diminish the number of people that are involved in uh, value creation and risk control. So the the, the last step is, let's say. A kind of experienced people filter, so you can have again the quantity versus quality discussion, and here of course we refer to 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 quality rather than quantity and it is it is it is important you have the 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 right uh, process in place and therefore you need people to take the decisions. You cannot have one one guy who takes all the decisions. He also needs to back up with, let's say, a team of people. So you need to create a team which refers to more than five FTEs. FTEs. Well, maybe it is four, maybe it is six. But let's say five is a good good number to to really indicate you need more than well, let's say, a small group of people, and you need mature people. You need people with knowledge of the, um, let's say, the, 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 the expertise that is needed to be involved with an important process of creating an intangible. Yeah, and then we've um, added, and, or added, and I think important to, to mention is filter number six, uh, where we say, well, it's also important that you've been more than three years involved in the management of the relevant intangibles. I think that's yeah, an uh, important element, but it's not so yeah, strong, I think, formulated in the, in the well, current uh, BEPS Action 8, 9, 10. And I think that's really um, made us a, almost like a, like a handout for tax authorities and not perhaps to how businesses actually run. And you could have already been uh, charged perhaps for, for five years with all your R&D uh, costs and it might have been or might seemingly have been uh, obligatory because it was kind of rule from the multinational you were in. Still, you have been funding it. So I think the historic component in, in uh, funding or absorbing the intangible cost is definitely something you should 
try to take into account. Uh, if it's not a new activity uh, where you completely start from scratch, but most activities, uh, they, they might shift within your multinational, but still there is some, some history, so you might have uh, a kind, kind of leftover entitlement to uh, return of the relevant intangibles. That, that's where the three years come from. So if you want to identify where are these um, important DEMPI functions, the funding and the assets, and you want to anchor them to the residual, then you need to identify which entities are doing those DEMPI functions and which one do pr uh, provide uh, the, the funding for developing this intangible and the assets and the risk control functions and to be able to have insight in this analysis of, of elements you should make a full value chain analysis which is functions, risks and assets and the linking to the people who perform these functions and where, where are they, which entities. And then you may come up with, okay, I have an important entity because it pays for really important people. The only thing is they are not living in the same jurisdiction. And how do we deal with this? Yeah, so where... Uh can you, can you still have, that was I think in uh, slide number three, where you can have the zero or low tax rate entity, eh, or, or perhaps even a tax haven entity, is it then sufficient to uh, fly in uh, ten times a year, or, or every week one day, uh, formalize certain decisions in order to anchor the IP to that uh, entity, and does a split payroll uh, provide a solution? Does it provide substance? I assume you would fly every month one day to this uh, tax haven entity. Uh, are, are you relatively anchoring your uh, IP? Because you will perhaps formalize certain decisions, but most decisions might have been already prepared outside of this uh, jurisdiction and just rubber stamped. So that, that might not be a good thing, no. eh, to say the least. And so for, for, from my case, I can, I, I can imagine you have six or seven people living there and one is, is there on, on, a, on a split payroll. Then of course your position is much better than the whole team is on a split payroll position, which would not make a good case. Yeah, just, just formal meetings, formalized decisions short business trips does, does not help you, does not anchor or provide uh, sufficient uh, substance. So if, if you could then Let's go. have identified the important DEMPI functions, the, uh, the, the assets and the funding related to developing the intangible, um, we, you, you, you come into the area of the, the full value chain analysis and one of the techniques that we apply at TPA is the profit contribution analysis. So you identify the core functions, the value adding functions, and you weigh them relat relatively to each other. So this is the first column in the next table. You have identified the processes and you make um, a weighing relatively to each other and you have identified the sub-processes. So which processes make that core process? So if strategy is one core process, and it is in most of the cases, then the sub-processes can be assessing external business environment, setting up 
the strategy of the group or the communication or the ideas for making the strategy develop business unit strategies aligned with let's say the overall strategy the general strategy the implementation of the strategy and the monitoring of let's say the KPIs the strategic initiatives and who is involved in this most most of the times these are people with names this is Tom or, or Jen or it is somebody who is sitting somewhere and that is the, the, the last five columns can also be ten doesn't matter and then there those the ten percent of the relative uh, relative weighting of, of the strategy function can be divided in well let's say entity A five percent entity B one uh, C1, D1, and E2. That makes up for for for, for 10 percent. And uh, in this way, you can do that for all core for, uh, core functions. And in the end, you will see that entity A has, let's say, um, a contribution or um, has the right to the residual for a certain percentage. Uh, and, and I think in, in a really large uh, multinationals, you have a lot of process uh, mappings and, and uh, authority schemes. And exactly there, would where we shown some of the sub processes, and quite detailed already, it is reflected who will do what in what what uh, whole, whole flow diagrams. So that's quite often a good start to analyze already and the strategy how is that actually being set up and there is a process behind it and you get some weighting again then within this 10% strategy and you can uh, yeah, then, then divide it again over all the uh, sub process and you will know probably which departments are involved which uh, and what, what is the number of uh, FTEs in the relevant departments so that that's how you can uh, document it and, uh, and, then, it, yeah. it. and then you have the entitlement to the residual profit yeah perfectly measured out in uh, percentages almost yeah and I, it's also important that there is a process how to how you have arrived to that certain um, allocation of profit so this makes a kind of academic analysis towards let's say your end product your 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 last product having the the entitlement to the residual in place okay let's move to the next slide okay some some references to uh, value chain analysis i think this is one of the other uh, uh, example we mentioned earlier make a kind of uh, matrix of who is uh, performing which functions so we've uh, taken an example of brand or brand management brands and trade names and then creating value for that so the, the five elements development okay who is in this example the C stands for uh, center and L stands for local entity, and not, not located at the headquarter. So who is actually performing control uh, in the development? Well, the, the central entity who is providing the funding for the development. Also, the central entity is doing it. And here you see funding provided by uh, the central entity, C. But that's where we mentioned earlier it's also good to have a look at uh, history uh, was it actually always provided by central or do we have a history where perhaps the local entity was also uh, absorbing absorbing part of the cost and kind of pre beps it was yeah, having perhaps a less strict focus on the control over the relevant tempe functions but still was some some funding so 
and it's it's perhaps C slash L. And then in more future years it's only C. And who is controlling and bearing the risk? So we can take the six steps in, in risk management and make a make a matrix and, and map it and there and whether it's C or L or, or any other number of entities in it, you can again make a kind of uh, weighting. And quite common used uh, element is of course the so-called RACI uh, matrix. Uh, also there you can give a certain weighting to performing uh, activities by the responsible person the activities performed by the accountable uh, person. So you can make a kind of cross matrix and, and see where the uh, value creation ends up or, or where is the kind of center of gravity with uh, perhaps some smaller satellites around it. So in this, in this table you can also see if that the, the funding and the risks are aligned. If there would be uh, a misalignment between the funding and the risks then you, you, you fall back to that uh, risk-free rate of return. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is one example, and it, it's pretty explicitly mentioned in the earlier published uh, transfer pricing decree of the Netherlands in 2013. So there, there you will see some examples of management of intangible. Yeah. Okay. Let's go to the first to the next slide. Yeah, this is a simplified visual of the examples eight, nine, and ten, as mentioned in action eight to ten of the OECD. So we refer to page under twenty-one and further. In this example, we have primary an entity resident in country X and that's the owner of a trademark and trade name uh, of a certain brand of watches. Now they are starting with a subsidiary in country Y. It's a new market and the brand name and trademark is not recognized yet in that market. And then you have in the examples a kind of yeah, slow, slow build up of substance relating to the to the marketing and trade name, and it's uh, growing from in example eight. You have a brand and trade name being economically owned and managed, therefore, by a premier. As so all the important tempe activities are being performed in country X. What is the subsidiary in country Y doing? Yeah, only uh, marketing support functions. I think in the, the, the classic example is of course just uh, yeah, uh, contacting local media like newspapers or even very local newspapers and placing ads which have been provided by the headquarter in, in country X and just perhaps they are translated or the layout is a little bit adjusted but that's it. It's a more um, classic cost center like function so that would in, in the light of the Dempe and the weighting not really attract any weight in, in where to allocate uh, profits to, to this uh, intangible. And the other function of the subsidiary is the distribution of the watches in the country. Yeah, and of course there they are uh, yeah, a revenue center. It can be a limited risk distributor. So also their limited profits would uh, allocate to this. Then they, they change the example in, in nine yeah, where you have the subsidiary performing yeah, the full marketing function, uh, it's still it's a new market, so the brand is unknown, but now the subsidiary performs full marketing and has full budget control on 
on how much to spend on, on the marketing and there is no direct payment from the headquarter, from Primair, for performing these uh, activities. And example 8, they mentioned that most likely a kind of cost plus uh, remuneration is sufficient for these very limited risk activities relating to marketing countrywide. And example 9, the yeah, importance of the, the marketing and especially the yeah, control over risks is moving already to the subsidiary and yeah, full marketing activity no payment and in this example you would have costs incurred by the subsidiary are more or less comparable to other independent uh, companies so there you would also expect that the subsidiary is making a much higher profit compared to the role of uh, a limited role of limited distribution. And of course, you see that the economic ownership of the intangible yeah, is being more anchored in country Y. So, therefore, and there should be much more. Uh, profit which they can only pick up from the market by selling their uh, watches so you might think already of a, a small adjustment to the prices of the watches when they're being sold to your subsidiary then it continues also after example 10 but in example 10 and uh, the subsidiary is even performing more marketing activities and especially they are incurring much more costs than comparable independent uh, companies because they have a much larger functional contribution to the marketing so they're looking at what would be uh, an appropriate remuneration for for the subsidiaries and you could think of example one of course lower the much more the prices of the watches or as an alternative uh, you might consider perhaps a so-called residual split uh, you would first remunerate primary and the subsidiary for their routine functions and the residual profit is then to be split in uh, awaiting uh, how much does headquarters still contribute or did already earlier contribute to some marketing activity before they opened up the subsidiary in country Y. So that's one method. Or as a, as a reflection of that, you would also expect, of course, that the subsidiary gains a much more higher profit than, than in the situation where it's limited in the performing functions. And then pays less for its watches. Yeah, the the price uh, would would go down. It's perhaps also a reflection of uh, who's owning this this market. So it's also a little bit the, the bargaining uh, theory that comes up here, because the subsidiary got really developed, and now it's not perhaps a new market anymore. Mm. But it's really developed by them. Yeah, entitling them to uh, much higher uh, profit. Okay, brings us to the to the last uh, slide. Yeah, I see one yeah, question in between. Yes, of course, the uh, slides will be available on the website tpa/global.com after the webinar. Also, a recording of this webinar will be made available on the website. Okay, questions on substance and brands. In relation to the examples uh, 8, 9, and 10? Yeah, from, from, uh, from the examples, you can already see uh, where, where is the focus on to uh, see the, the evidence and the substantiation of your activities. So it starts with, of course, determining what is exactly the nature of the intangible examples it's then branding and, uh, and 
marketing. In the matrix that we've shown in the earlier slide, you can determine with the uh, yeah, RACI or you can check the, the processes behind it who's making final decisions on branding. I think of approval of the budget for the marketing activities, approval of processes, how can you display this brand in the, in the market. Um, where are the marketing activities uh, compensated? Are they directly compensated? Uh, the example where they are, of course, directly compensated it's, it's easier to do that because they were a kind of cost center. So a markup on the marketing cost is being reimbursed to the subsidiary in the example. Or is it uh, performed indirectly because there is given a discount on the watches? And that might be perhaps an indication that your uh, yeah, that the, the tendency of the marketing activities is already considered to be much yeah, higher or more performance than, than a mere cost plus uh, remuneration. And you can also try to see what, what are comparable independent companies doing, eh? assuming of course they are in a similar situation, that means having a long-term marketing and distribution agreement based on which they are entitled to use the trade name and trademark and then decide whether they invest all their uh, well, funds in, in the marketing or are they waiting for the headquarter to, to instruct them and perform uh, uh, more support-like functions. Uh, are the, the costs higher than, than comparables? Yeah, then you're moving more to uh, residual split uh, profit split situation are they, they relatively low and because they are reimbursed by the headquarter yeah then then you would more tend toward um, cost plus so already that uh, gives some indication of the role the subsidiary in this example is playing and then yeah most important I think are the costs adequately uh, compensated by the margins they earn on the resale of the watches in the relevant market. Uh, if you incur for a longer period losses, you would expect to, to uh, recap those losses in a later period, but that also shows already you're behaving much more like a profit center than in the initial example number eight as a kind of cost center. Okay, I'm watching now if there is any more questions. I see that there is a, a correction on our website explanation. It says the uh, real description of our website is tpa-global.com. So for anybody who is interested in the slides or wants to hear the presentation again, it is um, tpa-global.com. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and of course, feel free to uh, send your, your questions, which you still might have. We're uh, happy to get back to you with uh, our vision or uh, answers. Okay, this webinar was um, presented by Igor Peters and uh, Patrick Dijhuis. Thank you very much for your attention.